Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I have I have the rampant thoughts about that because yeah, yeah. to defeat the AI, you need our security architecture, right? Not to be blatantly <laughs> self-promotional, but it's true. Yeah. Like if so, what we did is like in bit for example, the AI can't steal your Bitcoin. So why can't it steal your money off a server? Right. Like what what's the difference? Well, that's the hole you can drive a truck through, is that the server is not using cryptographic proofs and the HSM is not using cryptographic proofs. So Today and conventionally, not in our system, obviously, we're doing it a different way, but conventionally, that's what's happening. So now, any vulnerability in that system, of which in typical systems, there are hundreds, some there are thousands, I've literally written in my past 100 page reports on how broken a, a single thing is, and all the 100 different ways you can break into it. Mm -hmm. So an AI is going to be way better at doing that analysis than me. We're going through something absolutely historic. Technologies across the board are growing exponentially. It's a disruption that's going to completely redefine the way businesses compete. In the next decade, we're going to lose 40% of today's Fortune 500 companies. The exponential growth of computing is continuing. AI is nowhere near its full potential. Whether you like it or not, that the future cannot be stopped by anyone. Hi there, everybody. This is Mark for Bankoff, and welcome to the Future Tech and Foresight podcast. This is episode number 146. So uh, it has been a while since I've had uh, somebody come onto the podcast to talk about cryptocurrencies. Uh, for all of you that were listening a couple of years ago, it was certainly one of the topics that I love talking about the most. Uh, so I'm glad to be able to bring this topic back to the podcast. It's very interesting and I think there have been uh, significant contributions to the space and technology over the last couple of years. Uh, so yeah, I'm just uh, really glad to be able to, uh, to speak to somebody so knowledgeable. Um, I'll get into the guest in a minute uh, about cryptocurrencies. So what is this episode about? Uh, in this episode, we explore the thrilling world of cryptocurrency and blockchain technology with Mihao, a pioneer in digital security from MatterFi. So this all comes amidst the uh, rising concerns over about $200 million stolen in digital assets just in Q1 of 2024. And Mihao shares uh, his groundbreaking insights into MatterFi's innovative solution that combines uh, enhanced security with user-friendly digital identities, which is a key point to this entire discussion. And I'll get into that in a minute. So we dive into the challenges of crypto security breaches, the revolutionary concept of using names instead of complex addresses, and how MatterFi is navigating the intricate regulatory landscapes. Plus, we discuss the broader implications, of course, of artificial intelligence, and we touch on quantum computing on the future of blockchain technology, as well as many other uh, points in the discussion. So who is Mihao? So Michael Mihao, is a seasoned leader uh, with a track record of pioneering innovative solutions in the crypto world. So Mihao is the CTO and co-founder of Swiss Fortress and CEO, co-founder and co-inventor of MatterFi. So MatterFi is building a revolutionary security platform that uses distributed systems to decimate single point of failure risks. And Swiss Fortress is a crypto wallet that allows you to send secure transactions to names not addresses. We'll get into why this is actually a really big deal and why I was very excited to talk to Mihao specifically about this. Um, I think that the conversation is excellent. Mihao is, of course, a very likable guest uh, who certainly knows what he's talking about. So anybody that's interested in the crypto space in general and, of course, the technology is, I think, really sure to get something out of the discussion. Hi there, Mihal. Thank you very much for coming onto the podcast today to talk about uh, one of my more uh, favorite topics, but I haven't really talked about it in a while on the podcast. And that's like crypto, of course, security and all the work that you're doing. So I'm looking forward to uh, to getting into it today. Thanks for coming on. Awesome. Glad to be here. Yeah. Uh, so as, as I mentioned at the beginning of every episode with guests, uh, I like to get an understanding of what brought you into the industry and the space that you're working in. So like a uh, whether it's a personal anecdote or an interesting story, like what what attracted you into, in this case, it would be uh, crypto uh, cryptocurrencies. Well, uh, I've been hacking since I was 15. 
So before there was crypto at all, there was just computers. I started on the IBM PC Junior. So my sort of thing that always interests me is how do things work? How do you break them apart in a positive way and then make them better? So as a kid, that was like video games. And then it was like modem hacking, right? Because this was, you know, when I got into it, it was 1985, mm. 1986, 1987, uh, IBM PC Jr. <laughs> right? So that's <laughs> dating myself severely, but right. it was really fun. And, it, it, you know, the basics have always been the same even though the tax you know, really moved to a place that, you know, somebody born today doesn't understand how like there were no cell phones, but, mm -hmm. you know, I, I got to, you know, already live through all that. And I always just want to make stuff better. Right. So this company is basically one culmination of that journey, like where I was kind of like, okay, what's the hardest problem mm. in security today that's really affecting consumers and businesses, which is just rampant in theft and fraud. And then how do I, break the old way and create a new way. And, and so I met some friends along the way, Chris Odom being one, another one's Justice Ranveer that already had invented portions of it. And then I put it all together and, and I finished it. I wrote nine patents. Um, there are now 15 hmm. inventions in the space that are attributed to me um, that, you know, basically took that product, those original ideas and turned them into something very commercial. Hmm. And along the way, like the way I got here was, um, like I worked for the U.S. Navy. I made an intelligence system. I was like in my office in Georgetown when the airliner hit the Pentagon. Okay. One of my wow. employees was like driving by when that happened. You know, so she called me like in a massive panic. Ultimately, everybody I knew was okay, but obviously that day wasn't okay. Yeah. Um, and you know, it it it's like one of those things where you know you just want to make things better and so for me personally it's always been about creating value but my little devilish side is like oh i want to break it see how it works and then make it better and because i enjoy the process of at least in a white hat way breaking it so i've always been a white hat i've never done any black hat stuff although interesting enough like if you're in this space long enough you have plenty of opportunities to go black hat like you sure. people i get recruited all the time by the sure. dark side and i'm sure. just like no nah, i'm sorry i'm more like jedi <laughs> so it's a great way of putting it <laughs> I like that <laughs> you know so I, I don't do no i don't do no evil but um yeah that's how i got into it it's just always it's like a lifetime fascination where you want to have the maximum impact and you want to do it and like the way you like to do it yeah like the, the, the way that like kind of like feeds your brain and feeds your curiosity it's it's like being maximally curious and just following your curiosity will lead you down the path of like the thing that you're most passionate about. And then if you can innovate in that, then, you know, with this company, we got lucky. Cause I think it's a, I think it's a thing that'll, you know, maybe a m m multi-billion dollar valuation type mm -hmm. deal. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's, Ooh, well, thanks. <laughs> the AI, <laughs> AI getting into it. Oh, wow. Huh? I got fireworks. <laughs> that's it that's really it, interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, it it understands billions. Yeah, yeah. There should be like dollar signs just following. Sure. This guy right yeah. now. It's funny because well, like there's a way to turn that off, and I just I never bother. And then so <laughs> in the completely wildly inappropriate times, it just like throws a, a, a thumbs up. <laughs> I think it'll I think it'll add some some uh, unique perspectives or some unique uh, uh, visuals throughout the whole conversation. If we're going to be talking about you know crypto and all these things that are going on there, I'm I'm actually now more engaged with what's going going to come up on your screen <laughs> so all of you listening for, for, yeah, yeah for those of you listening yeah yeah there were balloons and there was thumbs up and uh, i think there was fireworks uh, looked like so, it looked like yeah. it. hilarious um uh well maybe maybe a good place to to start after that is giving a little bit of context about the industry so as we were talking about uh before recording uh, I think a lot of people that listen to the podcast are at least marginally aware of cryptocurrency and the the entire space. And I think in general, there's an understanding that like it's rife with theft and hackers and spammers and all sorts of things like that. Uh, could you maybe make that a little bit more tangible for us? Like if there are some statistics about like how much money is being stolen or the, the, um, uh, just the level of problems, yeah. and challenges in, in the space. The, the problem, right? So yeah. yeah, the problem is tremendous. I mean, basically, if you just go on the conventional media, there's almost every day, hey, this DeFi contract got hacked or these CeFi exchange got hacked mm -hmm. or, you know, this wallet lost this much money or this drainer, you know, took out this much with a, you know, a fake site, whatever. 
there's a there's a website called web3 is going great.com which you could google and it's basically like the headline is web3 is going just great and it's definitely not an enormous grift that's pouring lighter fluid on the already smoldering planet <laughs> right. and they have a they have a running you know amount of money that's been lost in defi web3 uh right now i'm looking at it right now it says 72.972 billion so we figure it's about 10 million a day and 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 that's just the stuff that you know about that you hear about because a lot of people that lose money, like if their wallet gets hacked, they're not going to go, you know, put it on CNN. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because they I don't want people to know that they had the wealth or that they have even more wealth like that, right? And, you know, that they got hacked and they're trying to deal with it with the authorities. So the problem is actually far worse than is publicly known, right? Um, and it's really blatant. It's like um, digital assets, you know, on both one hand, create this incredible amount of privacy, autonomy, and freedom for the world. And it depends. On the other hand, it's it was just like staking a giant sign in the yard saying, okay, hackers, come here. Here's a whole new thing of uh, hacking you can do. And, yeah. you know, I do know some black hat people anonymously, like they interact with me. Uh, I got some, I would call black hat fans uh, of our tech and, and, mm -hmm. and they'll probably be hacking our stuff at some point. I might even be like, hey, here's, here's a test server. I want to sure. see if you can sure. break it. But they, you know, I mean, they're not like friends from the friend. I mean, I'm not, I don't like evil people <laughs> generally, but, understood, understood, but, understood. but I end up interacting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and basically these people, their sole job is stealing crypto. That's it. That's all they do. It's a full-time thing. It's just stealing crypto. That's all they sure. do 24, seven, seven, they've got entire operations. It's very sophisticated. You know, they do everything from phishing to, to drainers, to fake sites, the whole nine. Mm -hmm. None of it is particularly sophisticated in the sense that, like, oh, it's hard to understand how they did it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still sort of tragic for the world, right? Because it's like, here we have this incredibly powerful, awesome tech that's, like, helping people. And mm -hmm. at the same time, we got this dark side chasing everybody. And you always yeah. got to watch out. And it creates all this, like, FUD and fear. And, like, oh, my God, you know. Are we going to get, and we're just, we're like, okay with it. We're just like, okay, you know, I got every day I get like 10 phishing emails. Right. It, and it, it's like, we're just, it's just normal, yeah. normal, you know, yeah. like everybody's yeah. just like, eh, this is just how it is, you know, but, but still that creates this barrier of entry, you know, to the real positive side of things. So things could be way better. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people, some people think, oh, well, we've solved security or we're always going to be using usernames and passwords. It's like, that's the state of the art. You know, this is always going to be this way. And to me, I see why that assumption lives in everybody's heads, both consumers and a lot of tech experts, is because that's how it's been forever, right? Mm -hmm. Like pretty much since the beginning of the internet, we've been dealing with this sort of dark side problem, right? And uh, that is not good, right? And that's one of the things that we at Matterfy you know, we're a new security company uh, that's making traditional finance and crypto far easier and simpler to use, mm. but the security tech is largely invisible, right? So you don't know it's there, but in our system, you it can't be fished. Mount Gox can't happen. FTX insider job can't happen. DeFi hacks can't happen. The DeFi knows KYC. Uh, the on-chain stuff knows KYC. So you can prove each other's identity to each other, but it's still all decentralized. So like we're doing all this stuff that people have given up on. Mm. Like, like literally, like, mm. like to me, it's like the problem is so huge. It's like, well, why haven't like 10 other people already done what I'm doing? And the, and the, and the truth is I've been at this in this company for five years and no one's done it. Like no one's created what we've created, even though there is like this giant gaping hole you can drive a truck through. Uh, my my initial question would be why why hasn't anybody done it if it's if the problem is so severe and i assume very profitable if solved is it just so challenging or it's really hard it? yeah yeah if it was easy i wouldn't be here yeah. right like yeah. uh and i would say my entrepreneur journey wasn't easy either because like what we were doing you know people were like well this other stuff just works. Like, why would you guys even compete with all this stuff that works? Like all this DeFi and CeFi that already works. It's mm -hmm. like, well, I I posit to you that it doesn't work here, <laughs> you know? And and so we sort of, you know, made our way and we raised, I mean, at this point, almost uh, between the revenue and the money raised, we, we're at 5 million. We're about to raise another 20 and our, we're actually going into a series A right now. Mm -hmm. So we'll start to get like real, real funding. But it was a... Uh, uh, 
not an easy journey, I would say for sure. Right. Yeah. Um, because of that question, it's like, well, hmm. you know, do we really need a new wheel? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. You definitely need a new wheel. Cause look, everybody's like running off with your wheel. Right. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> so, so, um, so that's been interesting, right? We've had, and then explaining to people like how it is that we're different when they're sort of ingrained with this is the way it is and it's never going to change. Um, so there's, there's challenges with, you know, being, a, a, a successful player in in the space when you're genuinely trying to create something new um and that's you know that's that's been our journey mm -hmm. uh should we jump into what the wheel actually is <laughs> sure sure absolutely yeah, yeah. No, i love i love i wrote yeah. all the patents for the wheel so if i can't explain <laughs> it to you we're done yeah yeah precisely <laughs> precisely um uh, as, as i mentioned before the the recording um maybe we could start with uh what an ad i don't know i don't i don't think i want to go like what is an address but maybe also explain like how transferring these assets is so complicated um and then and then we can jump uh into exactly what you guys are doing okay so i can give you a two second overview of like the existing state of crypto right so yeah. basically there's there was this old school notion world war ii enigma machine it had symmetric cryptography right the next major invention in crypto was public-private key cryptography. We basically just said there's two keys instead of one symmetric key that both decrypts and encrypts. So if, if you encrypt with one, you can decrypt with the other and vice versa. And so what people said is, okay, now I'm going to call one key public and one key private. Mm -hmm. One I'm never going to reveal to people. The other one is just the public one I can, I can freely give. So the properties of this are interesting. So to create a digital signature, I sign a known message with my private key, and now you can decrypt it with my public key, which everybody knows is mine. And now you know that I signed it, therefore I proved my identity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The other thing is encryption of, say, funds or messages. Like if um, I encrypt something with my public key or somebody else encrypts something with my public key, then I can only decrypt it with my private key meaning mm -hmm. I'm the only one that can read the message or I'm the only one that can receive the money. So what happened in crypto, right, with the Satoshi white paper is they said, okay, well, why don't we just uh, take these publicly encrypted entries and just attach a number to them that says you've got this much money. And now the only people that can spend that are the people with the corresponding private key. So that public key, that derived public key is your address. Right. So when you use a crypto wallet, you're and you say, hey, send me money to this number. Essentially, what you're saying is send this money to my public key. Then later I can spend it by proving that it's mine because I can decrypt that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's crypto. Right. That's the hopefully the, the simplest, fastest explanation of crypto. And ever. and, and uh, for those people that that uh, aren't or haven't done it right in a, in a tangible real world manner those public keys are like a long string of digits right numbers right 256 letters. bit number yeah and which when you when yeah, you convert to hexadecimal which is 16 bits you get a a, a shorter string that's still human readable but still acdf each you know yeah. basically it's zero to nine plus you know the the hex <laughs> so yeah. so so you you get some letters in there too yeah. uh and it's not easy to understand. If you get it wrong, remember what I just said, right? That's actually mm -hmm. a public key that you have to, a message that's signed with a public key that you have to decrypt. And so if you get that number wrong, then the math doesn't work and you just lost your money. Exactly. And I think that uh, is, uh, maybe I'll ask the question, um, is that included in this roughly $10 million a day that's lost? I don't think it is. I think it's, that $10 million a day that's lost is people literally taking money from other people and maybe not included the people that are sending money into a black hole. <laughs> or correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, it's actually the public private key thing works really well. Mm -hmm. The theft and fraud doesn't come from breaking that. It's not like somebody's sitting there like, okay, it's actually extremely difficult. It's going to take quantum computing to yes. just randomly break into a such a break into break a public address and spend it even though you're not the owner like that mm -hmm. that's a that's a problem that hasn't been yet solved at some point it will be and then the keys will just get longer and the algorithms will change probably not tremendously mm -hmm. but they will change and when they do um we're going to still have the security right the problems these days don't come from that at all they come from 
you deposit money on an exchange, right? And then all of a sudden you're not using your wallet. So remember at, like earlier I said, there's a hole you can drive a truck through. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to like really make that hole tangible. And I'll give you kind of like the most common way that these end users I know of that have experienced tremendous amounts of loss. And this is still happening to the tune of millions, tens of millions a day, probably, mm -hmm. which is, okay, they're using a centralized exchange. And when they're asked to like use that centralized exchange, what happens is they, they log into a website like say Kraken or Coinbase or Binance or whatever, yeah. right? And they set up an account and, and then there's some KYC and like, you know, they're, they're asked to provide their driver's license. There's some KYC check that comes back and says, okay, this person's not a terrorist, not a black hat, whatever. We, we trust them more or less. They can do business here within these limits, you know, whatever the internal rules are. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the system says, okay, now you want to trade Bitcoin for Ethereum. Great. So deposit your Bitcoin into this address and it just provides you an address. And so you deposit some Bitcoin, right? And then, and then you trade it for Ethereum. Then some point later, you do a withdrawal. And now the system's like, well, give me your withdrawal address. So you type in your withdrawal address. If you get it wrong, you lose the money. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is like super common. But the, the hack is, okay, I just steal your username and password. And uh, I just pretend you're you. And I yep. put in my attacker withdrawal address. And I take all your money. Yep. And that's the basis of the SIM phone hack, right? Like basically... And this happened to me. I was going to Burning Man like four years ago. And right before Burning Man, it's like the hackers knew that all these people are going to be at the burn. And they, you know, some, some guy at the AT&T office in Atlanta, like, you know, somehow my, my, my uh, phone ID number got moved to another phone. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and now this person had my phone number. So they went into my Coinbase and they did exactly what I just described. Of course, I, smart about that i didn't have any money there yeah. so it was zero they got zero dollars but they still broke in and they successfully tried this hack um and so what is the giant hole well like why can't i just connect my metamask or my crypto wallet straight to the custody system like why is there a web interface at all like wh why am i being asked to put in an address i could get wrong right a and then not only can i get it wrong and hurt myself as a user Mm -hmm. but an attacker can exploit that just take all my assets yeah. right so that's the whole one of the main many holes um but that that's a huge one that you can drive a truck through right now right and that's yeah. one of the things that we've solved um in terms of our tech and uh, so if, if i can just jump in here i think yeah for those people that haven't done any kind of uh, crypto or bitcoin transactions uh maybe i'll just stress like how stressful it is especially when you're a newbie transferring money and crypto for the for the very first time in this space because you know that if you get one letter wrong you're you're screwed. Yes, yeah, so everybody does the test. Uh, this is Satoshi test or they'll send yeah. me 0.001 ETH test or exactly. send me one USDT or 1.718 DT yeah. and yeah. then I know it's you, right? Exactly. <laughs> because and, we're trying yeah. trying to make sure that the address is correct anyway. So exactly. You, you exactly. get it, right? Yeah, yeah, no. I, I mean, look, I've I've made the mistakes in in the space before as well. I'm not going to talk about them because it's it's painful. But I think anybody who goes into the space, they go on that journey and they realize that. Um, but for those people that haven't done that, it's uh, I mean, you kind of have to get your your feet wet in order to really understand this. And it's not like there's a, a centralized bank behind all of these transactions that say, oh, well, you sent your money to the wrong place. Well, we have insurance. We have here's we can we can. Um, Reverse that transaction and here's your money again. Try again. It's not like that. This, yeah. is, this is adult money, right? Uh, the way that yeah. I see it, it's, uh, you know, fiat currency is, uh, and and um, the whole system with the banking, it's, that's money for children because it's play money. If you make a mistake, oh, well, we'll reverse that transaction. Your money's safe. There's insurance. All of this, it's well, crypto and Bitcoin. It's you're responsible. You're your own bank. Uh, you have to be an adult. Um, when you're making all these uh, transactions and moving your money and investing properly. Um, anyways, I just wanted to throw that out there for those people that may not have done any uh, actual ac activities within crypto. And I think it's, I think it's an, an important uh, idea to, to think about. Right. So what I would say is, you know, if you're new to this, like take 10 minutes to go read Satoshi's white paper because it's actually like surprisingly easy to understand. Yeah, like he has a nice short. little. It's only a couple it's short. pages. Yeah. 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 And you're like, okay, wow, like this public private key thing is really, you know, if you just attach money to these to these things and then people spend them with a um with the with the with the private key signature, then you're uh you're 
you know, it, it's really monumental. The other thing he solved was that was actually very ingenious was the double spend problem, mm -hmm. which no one had solved, right? Because remember this algo that I described has been around since the late sixties, early seventies, yeah. depending on who you credit with the original public private key idea. But um, he solved the double spend, which is proof of work, which we won't get into, but it basically means that, okay, you can't say you've got a balance of 10 Bitcoin. You can't spend it twice, you know, in the same block essentially and you, and you can't it's very difficult to try to like buy the ferrari and then buy a boat with the same right, money right. <laughs> uh so so that's another that's the actual major innovation in satoshi's white paper um but it's not the one that people really need to understand they need to understand like the first thing that i just described so yeah from a consumer point of view should, should we should we jump into exactly what what you guys are doing um, yeah absolutely yeah uh, i'd love to yeah uh because i have i mean the it's great talking to you, but the time's already winding down. I, I want to hear. <laughs> I want to hear uh, uh, what it is that you guys are doing, and then I have a couple, um, uh, hopefully, interesting follow-up questions. Uh, you know, talking about the future and, and what's going to happen. But uh, uh, tell tell me about your project and uh, exactly what you guys are up to. Okay, so we made it all work like PayPal. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> so in our system, you have a name like Mihao. And for the benefit, I, mean, I could throw it up on the screen and show you everything working. Like you can go to SwissFortress.com. It's one of our clients mm -hmm. out of Switzerland that you can like grab the wallet from there. Um, but, you know, and start playing with it. We're sort of in early beta. We're about to be in late beta. Like we're doing a really big release mm -hmm. in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much the production release of the desktop wallet. Uh, it supports all the majors plus Ethereum plus ERC-20. Um, and the main thing is it works like a regular wallet. You can still send and receive with traditional addresses. That's no problem, but we don't want you to do that. Yeah. What we want you to do is register for a name. Like I have the name Mihao, M-E-H-O-W, naturally because I came up with it. So I got the coolest name right away. I'm the Mihao, no other Mihao. <laughs> uh, and I can post that name on my Instagram and just say, take any of our wallets that's compatible, which is, is a Casper wallet. It's called Saris. That's about to come out of beta. So there's Space Dogs, which is already in beta. There is uh, Swiss Fortress itself. And now we have some major fintechs mm. that today I can't tell you who they are, but in a couple of weeks, they'll be in the press. And th these are not small fintechs. These are over, you know, they're global companies that are in the Fortune 500 that have okay. adopted our technology. And um, so we think it's going to get a lot of adoption. Uh, just because of that and we have a lot of new clients onboarding but let me get back to what it does you register for a name you can post that name publicly and your wallet will automatically receive all the funds it supports to that name and you don't have to understand anything about receiving addresses. you don't have to do tests everything is infallible you just say hey my name is Mihao. send me some ethereum and then somebody opens another one of our compatible wallets types in Mihao, send one ethereum hit send that's it done so it's like paypal yeah um and our wallets just magically know how to compute each other's receive addresses via i'm gonna get technical here for a second but it's a one-way non-interactive cryptographic proof um meaning that there's no like it's not like my wallet's telling your wallet hey this is my address you know use this one your wallet just knows mm. what my addresses are mm. um but the addresses are different Right. So here's a huge vulnerability that people don't talk about, but it exists in the ENS and unstoppable domains. Um, and it's so obvious that I'm just calling these things out by name because it's super obvious and people should just know about it. If you use unstoppable names, like say, you know, there's a YouTuber named Hashoshi.eth. And, you know, he was like, let's let's go use, uh, uh, you know, use this system. It's great. Well, in like about 30 seconds, I found out like all the transactions he's ever done with that name. Right. <laughs> because in unstoppable domains, the name and the receiving address that you use, that, that 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 the name is supposed to receive funds at, are stored on a public blockchain. So, and you can literally just write a scraper tomorrow mm -hmm. that just takes all the names of unstoppable domains, makes a list of all the receive addresses that have been registered on that on that smart contract, and just looks up all the money that everybody's ever transferred using those names. Yeah, and you can easily say. Hey, this guy is the richest guy on Supple Domains. This is the richest guy on ENS. So obviously, traditional finance and regular people, they're not going to use this. Like, what? Like, why would I have some potentially publicly identifiable information and, and have that, you know, be tied to me? And, and so people know that this is the money I received, right? Right. So it's a it's a massive, massive problem, right? So in our case, our system 
computes these addresses so that if I'm transacting with you and your identity, it's using one set of addresses. Now, if I'm transacting with another user, it's a different set of addresses mm -hmm. and the users don't know what the addresses are. Right. So one of the problems with ENS and Unstoppable is that all the money goes to the same address, right? So, so they'll have one receive address for say, you know, Ethereum, another one for Bitcoin. And if 100 people send you money, it's all going to that same address. So first of all, as the user, you can't tell unless you're manually like, you know, hey, okay, I know that it was Bob that sent me this money and Alice sent me this money on Wednesday and somebody else mm -hmm. sent me, Charlie sent it to me on Thursday, right? Which you're, as a user, you're not going to do, right? Or if you're a business, you're not going to do that. It's very right. difficult. Right. So you got to sit there and be like, okay, this transaction, this, it's just really broken. In our system, all that is automatic. Mm -hmm. So like if I receive money from you, I know it's from you 100%. And the other thing we've solved, and this is all decentralized, by the way, which is, so there is no centralized database or smart contract or anything that can be hacked. Um, we've got multiple patents pending now. Some of them are published around how we're doing this, mm. but, but essentially it is not breakable in any way that I know of. And I pretty much know all the ways that you can break into something. I mean, I've, I've broken into everything from voting machines mm -hmm. to... To, to websites, to just embedded systems, right? So this is my my jam, is this right, hacking. Right. So I made something where I was like, I want it to be as easy to use as PayPal. I want it fully decentralized. I want it uh, private to third-party observers, right? So that third-party observers can't like you know, figure out what's going on. At the same time, between the parties involved, I want it to be 100% compliant and KYC compatible. Right. And that's the last thing, the last element that we can talk about on the wallet side that we can get into the custody system, which is a whole nother, like, oh, I didn't know it was this broken, uh, that it even needed fixing, but it actually is if you just empirically look at how much money is being stolen. <laughs> so the last thing is the KYC, right? Because for all this stuff and, and, to work- I'm sorry, uh, uh, K KYC is know your customer. For know your customer, the KYC yeah. AML, right? So yeah. basically if you're a traditional finance organization or a money transmitter, you have a money transmitter license, you have to know what your customers are doing and who's who. And if you're transacting with those people, you have to know the same thing. So say you're Goldman Sachs, like the reason Goldman Sachs isn't on some DeFi contract trading with people is DeFi is basically a giant mixing money laundering machine, right? I mean, it, it's like put money at this address, retrieve money from here. Do you know where it really came from? Not, not really. Do you know who you're interacting with? Absolutely not. There's no cryptographic proof of anything. It's just money in, money out. You know, with with same or different assets, maybe you're getting some yield, what what have you. But the point is, is that no one really knows who the other fish in the ocean are, and you don't care unless you're interacting with them. Yeah. Right. And that's what's important. So, like in our system, there's a decentralized proof where I can sh literally show you my ID, and there's a cryptographic proof of it. So you know that if you send me Bitcoin, you're sending it to me. How Paul Spichalski, who lives in Wyoming, get this address, what have you, right? Mm -hmm. So that, and that's really important for institutional finance. And it's one of the major reasons why institutional finance, which is extremely useful and people, everybody uses it almost, right? Why there hasn't been this sort of merger between these spaces of DeFi, decentralized and on-chain and centralized. I mean, there's certainly massive growth in the space, but it's like, if you drive down the street and talk to random people, they don't have Bitcoin accounts they can spend yeah. and they buy gas with, they've got Wells Fargo accounts. Yeah. So my question is like, okay, well, why is that? Like, why can't all these things exist code to get together, right? In a seamless way. And that's the, the problem that we solved. So one of the major problems we solved is that name that allows you to receive any cryptocurrency. You can put it up on your Instagram. No one knows how much money you receive total, but all the people that you interact with Mm -hmm. know exactly what they sent you and they can even request a proof of who you are before right. they send the money. Right. 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 Which is really valuable. So now imagine that me how instead of being a private person is a bank, right? Now we're getting into the custody side of things. So the yeah. other thing we sort of rewrote completely and reinvented is digital custody. So I'm going to just back it up like completely for people that have no idea what digital custody systems are. Um, and explain that a little bit and then kind of explain not kind of explain exactly what the differences are between us and sort of the regular stuff, right? Perfect. Perfect. So, does that sound good to you? Yeah. Uh, just um, uh, I, mean, I just uh, went on. A, I just went off. So I want you. To, no, no, no. It's <laughs> to, it, to it's, it's great. Look, this is this is why I love the podcast. I always invite people that are much more uh, intelligent and informed than me, and I, I love listening to every single word. I'm just concerned about the time. Um, you know, if we have some some 17, 20 minutes left or so. Uh, could we could we do the custody thing uh, quickly and then move yes. into some other things? 
Absolutely. So I'm gonna give okay. you custody five minutes. Excellent. <laughs> so what is digital custody? It, it's a it's a system that runs at a bank or a financial institution that's storing your Bitcoin if you give it to them, right? And generally, the way it works right now is there's the hardware security module, which is a chip that's got the keys to the money that actually belongs to the customers, and that key is controlled by the company that's the custodian. And there's generally admins that have custody over that system. And basically, the second you give them your money, they can just do whatever they want with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's no visibility between your crypto wallet and what's happening in the custody system at all. There, it's just, you know, it's a black box and you just gave your money to the black box and now you can have what happened at FTX, which is, oh, look, we got the keys to the black box. There's $8 billion here. Oh, I'd like to make some political donations. I want to be a little famous. I'd like a, a, a FTX name on an arena. No problem. The customer funds will get it back. Yeah. It's not illegal, right? <laughs> so... Digital custody is very important. You have to have these things, um, but you have to have them in a way where that sort of thing and the other problem I described earlier, which is the Coinbase problem of, hey, random address, you know, withdrawal to a random address, and they have no idea if that random address is actually yours or somebody else's. Yeah, yeah. That needs to be solved, right? So, so that's what we created. We created a new digital custody system where there's an off-chain cryptographic protocol, just like you have in Bitcoin on-chain. And the HSMs that store the money just talk directly to the consumers. Mm -hmm. So, so and they'll only authorize a withdrawal when they have a digitally signed cryptographic proof from the consumer. Meaning that, like in the wallet, in the UI, it's like deposit withdraw. I just hit a withdraw button, I enter my PIN, or I tap my hardware wallet card, and it just magically happens. What actually happened under the hood is you signed a digital instrument with your private key. Now the HSM knows it's really you and will authorize the withdrawal. And in this system, you don't need admins at all. Well, not at all. You need them way less. You need the admins when you're loading new code or if or like a server melts down. Because we do it also multi-sig, which I won't get into. So it's not one server. There's multiple servers. And to steal money from our system, you either have to just set it up wrong or you have to be a super clever hacker and break into a secret vault that are worldwide into these actual, not just the machines, but the HSMs inside the machine. So it's just a thing that's not going to happen. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say... Not ever, because you know, as a security guy, you never want to say, "Look, look, it's a thousand percent infallible." Yeah, but yeah. pretty much, yeah. The, the the security architecture, at least, is you know, I think we're not going to make any mistakes, uh, and I think we're not going to lose any customer funds. Is my my take? Can I can I pause on this point? Yeah. Um, I I just had. Uh, the federal CTO of Intel Corporation on the podcast uh, this week, earlier this week, we were talking about cybersecurity. Um, so my mind is reeling about cybersecurity right now. And I know that within crypto, and you, you touched on this earlier. Um, I mean, cybersecurity and security in general is just so important in this space. Uh, I, I totally trust that. I mean, look, I've been talking to you for, for almost an hour. I, I understand that you understand what you're talking about. Um, you mentioned about uh, quantum uh, technologies possibly breaking into um, uh, crypto in general, and I know that yeah. this has always been a, an, an issue. Do you have thoughts about artificial intelligence and how it might be changing the game here uh, as uh, like a, a tool that can be leveraged for these black hat hackers to get into maybe not your system but other systems? Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I have I have the rampant thoughts about that because yeah, yeah. to defeat the AI, you need our security architecture. Right? Not to be blatantly <laughs> self promotional, but it's true. Yeah. Like if so, what we did is like in bit. For example, the AI can't steal your Bitcoin. So why can't it steal your money off a server? Right. Like what? What's the difference? Well, that's the hole you can drive a truck through. Is that the server is not using cryptographic proofs, and the HSM is not using cryptographic proofs. So. Today and conventionally, not in our system, obviously, we're doing it mm -hmm. a different way, but conventionally, that's what's happening. So now, any vulnerability in that system, of which in typical systems, there are hundreds, some there are thousands. I've literally written in my past 100 page reports on how broken a, a single thing is and all the 100 different ways you can break into it. Mm -hmm. So, an AI is going to be way better at doing that analysis than me, than any human ever, very soon, if not already, right? It, mm -hmm. it, this is a thing that's already happening. So in conventional computing systems that don't use cryptographic proofs for every single operation, the AI can find a hole. And the second it finds that one hole, it's all over. Yeah, exactly. The same like a hacker can find that one hole and, and it's all over. Yeah. Right. Yep. So, 
we to, to be AI proof, we need this last level of security. And we actually have, we're now starting up a little AI division where we're going to be doing AI agent wallets where the AI, you know, you can give it some money and it can go try and make you some money, uh, but it's all private. I mean, there's some really cool stuff to do with AI and, and digital assets, obviously. But the, the bigger problem is you really got to beef up the security before the AI, you know, actually gets to that super intelligence level. Right. Because right. all of a sudden, then after that, it's like, it's a huge problem. Oh, yeah, massively. Uh, and I think the AI will be at a super intelligence level before quantum computing is at a level where it can crack keys. But the quantum computing problem is actually way easier to solve in crypto than the AI problem because all we got to do is crank up the algorithms. I mean, I'm talking generally here, right? Yeah, like, like yeah. you're giving me two, two seconds. So there's all sorts of little caveats and stuff. But generally speaking, your, your AI is not going to be the ai is going to be breaking into stuff before the quantum computers are going to be breaking your keys um and uh that's my sort of theory and i'm no you know physicist expert but i do know a thing or two about security so it, it's really important to have the security go to the next level not just in you know on chain crypto but everywhere and that's like one of the things where like when i first was introduced to these ideas from my co-founders, which is Chris Odom and Justice Ranveer. Mm -hmm. Justice invented a pay codes for Bitcoin, which is the basis, one of the, the fundamentals of the name system. It's how one of the, the algorithms that we're using to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And Chris invented the off-chain cryptographic proofs based on triple signed receipts. So when I heard this, I was like, well, actually, if we combine this with some hardware and do these other things the other way, then then we've got this thing. And this was like five years ago before you know AI was such a huge thing, but it, it's... It definitely solves that problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I remember when I first got uh, introduced to cryptocurrencies, I mean, quantum computing was, I think, on every single uh, new white paper that was coming out on every single website of these new cryptos. Like, how we're going to deal with the with a quantum um, uh, quantum computing issue in the next couple of years. Uh, yeah. And the, and the, and the yeah. basic problem is in quantum computing, there's only really one problem, which is how big your keys are. And there's a few other yeah. things, yeah. but the amount of vulnerabilities in existing off-chain systems are in the tens of millions yeah. of vulnerabilities. Yeah. And any single vulnerability allows theft of all the money. Yes. <laughs> so where is the AI yeah. going to go first, right? Yeah. To try to solve a mathematical problem it can't compute its way out of yet? Yeah. Or... <laughs> <laughs> or is it going to be like, wow, there's a lot of rich fish in this pond and pretty much I got dynamite. So yeah, yeah exactly. Um, okay. I, I see that the, the time is winding down. Um, are there any other points that uh, we should uh, discuss with regards to uh, your project in particular, or can we move into like some of the other, like a couple of minutes on like, regulate uh regulatory issues that you no, no, i think our, our, our project i mean i feel like i gave you the the as deep as i can go yes, yes. for your audience you know you can go to the website matterfy.com yeah. and get the white paper if you're like super curious how we're doing everything under the hood but yeah um you can you can find all our published patents as well um so anyway i, I yeah let's let's move on okay awesome um so I guess I mean we we could also talk about each of these topics could be a could be a podcast in and of itself. But the the regulatory issue within crypto in general today, um, what what are your thoughts on uh, regulation? Is your and is your project going to be solving a lot of these issues? Because I know that KYC is is such an important yeah, absolutely. thing for these regula uh, yeah. regulators. The regulators want these rules and they're yeah. kind of like randomly flailing around making more rules and, yeah. and sometimes that, that results in like unintended consequences. So me, like I'm a libertarian personally, right? So so I want everybody to have all the freedom to do what they want. That said, you know, businesses mm -hmm. want the regulations, like they want to yeah. protect the consumers. Like it, it's it's ultimately a a thing where for the most part unless it's like you know really overreaching what we have in terms of reg and finance i don't have a problem with it at all right i, I think like okay you know you should have to have accredited investors for example right like you, you don't you don't want to yeah. you know have people that don't know what they're doing like you know stake their you know life savings on something they don't necessarily understand just yeah, because or, or mortgage maybe. their house to, to yeah, buy yeah. bitcoin at 20k or something or 17 yeah right right i mean yeah you know, now oh, that would have been a smart decision, but not yeah. when it went from 17 to three exactly. you know? yeah. and you were like, well, is this even going to go forward yeah. at all? You know, yeah. um, 
So hold on one second. Let me just turn that off. Um, so we uh, are here to solve the regulators' problems and make it way easier for them to make pro-business regulations that make sense. Because technically, for example, in our system, you can enforce travel rule. You can have you can just say, look, if if your transaction over this much, you have to know who your your counterparty is. If you are a system, that's really easy to do. Mm -hmm. Whether you're a custodian or an end user, right? You, it, you, we have a protocol I'm coming out with for atomic swap where in atomic swaps, for those that don't know, atomic swaps is when two people on chain agree to swap two assets. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the tech around that itself has been pretty good. There's a wallet called Atomic Wallet that already does this. But you don't know who your counterparty is. That's a huge problem. So like Goldman Sachs isn't out there saying, hey, okay, well, we got tons of USDT, for example, or tons of gold or tons of whatever, and we want to trade with you. We want to offer these uh, C5 services on chain. And the reason they're not doing it is because they don't know who the counterparty is. Right. Right. So it's just right now it's like atomic swap is just a, you know, if it's a super easy way for criminals to money launder. And as I've said before, as a sort of, you know, my mental thing is I want to break stuff, but I don't want to be evil. Right. right. So, right. so, so, and I don't want to support the evil actors. I don't want to support the people that are exploiting these systems to, for, you know, to create war and create death and yeah. create famine and create, you know, chaos. Mm -hmm. And so to, to prevent those things, you need the regulation, but more importantly, well, not more importantly, you need the regs plus the tech at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's, so I've spoken to Davos three times now, um, you know, when it was super early and and we had no products at all, but it's, and, you know, I hope we get, we, we do have some clients that are, I wouldn't say some, we have some big clients that are heavily regulated now mm. that soon will be using this tech exactly as I'm describing it. And I would say that the reason they signed on with us was because of exactly what I just described. Right. Gotcha. Um, okay. Last couple of minutes. Uh, one of the questions that I always ask my, my guests is, uh, to look towards the future. So, okay. uh, of course, you're going to be looking at this through the perspective of of your project, your organization. Um, for the average consumer investor out there, uh, crypto, I think, has been uh, incredibly interesting for the early adopters, especially. Uh, and it seems like each new wave, there's more people coming on. With, uh, with what you're doing, do you see in the next, let's say, five to 10 years, um, investing in crypto, being aware of like what's going on, uh, growing exponentially, or are there still a couple other challenges that need to be solved before, you know, this becomes a little bit more of a, of a mass adoption? Um, I, I want us to be the last solution. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I do think that if we get it out there, um, we've solved it basically all the problems which is usability security right yeah. um and so that is i mean it's it's a tough it's like when i say that i feel like damn i'm being really egotistical <laughs> right now but look nobody done it yeah 15 inventions later still no one's done it like we're still the only people doing this it's like and it does actually have these properties and now we're getting the fortune 500 clients signing up mm -hmm. so i'm like okay i guess right you know right, i'm right right, right. <laughs> but it, it is it is like when i say that i'm just like okay okay and i'll just express some gratitude to the general universe that like i'm very grateful to have this opportunity because very like as an innovator and a and i've been an entrepreneur my whole life really uh you you there's a lot of opportunity out there to invent cool stuff mm -hmm. but rarely do you get to invent something that could actually change the world it could be right. could be a thing that 10 years from now, everybody's using in some way or form, right? So, you know, I think our path as a company is, is we're going to continue for the next 12 to 18 months. And then we're probably going to get bought by somebody way bigger. They can take that message even further than, you know, we can mm -hmm. just because of this, you know, the sort of the scaling problem. Sure. sure. Um, so yeah, I hope, I hope we help solve that mass adoption issue. Um, and I'm really, that's one of my main goals in life is to create enough value for the consumer and the business to, you know, really jump on this new way of doing things where there are no username and passwords. Yeah. There's just private keys and, you know, that's all you got to worry about. 
And we have really easy ways of handling that, the sort of the private key problem also. So people aren't like, okay, well, now I don't have to deal with addresses and everything's yes. a private key. Well, how do I manage my private key? Which is a whole nother, we won't yeah. get into yeah, that. Yeah, here, yeah. Right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's another, that's for another time. I've, um, I've, I think I fixed it too. I right. humbly submit. <laughs> <laughs> but but if we like, I've got another ten minutes. If you want to go longer, I'm, I'm cool. I, I'm enjoying I, this. I, so. I, I have. To, I, I mean, I I love these kinds of conversations, Michal. Um, I I unfortunately do have to go. I have I have another call right <laughs> after this. Um, cool. No but, I, but I think I think what you just said is is actually a perfect place to uh, to end the conversation. So uh, it's hopeful for the future, which is kind of what I I like to end all these podcasts. Uh, it's a note that I like to end all these podcasts on. Um, I'll have uh, your LinkedIn, um, the website uh, of your of your company up on the show notes. Is there any other place that you want people to reach out to you from, uh, follow you? Uh, no, that's that, that's fine. I mean, I'm like yeah. Hacks on Twitter, but yeah, um, you know, the company stuff's fine. We're doing a whole. We just hired a marketing department like a week ago. So okay. there's gonna be a lot more like cool information. You know, yeah. before we were just like heads down, sort of secret ish mode. Uh, sure implementing this beast i mean we have almost 800,000 lines of code at this point so it, it's it's for a small team which started with five people it's a yeah, lot yeah yeah yeah, yeah for <laughs> so, sure this <laughs> was like a garage project where we're like no we believe we really believe so uh yeah, yeah. i appreciate the, awesome. the positive energy and it was great to be on yeah well thanks thanks very much for coming on uh it's great to be I guess I could say reintroduced to uh, to crypto in general. Uh, it's been a while since I've been talking about it. I went down to El Salvador la uh, last month, so I got a, I, I got reintroduced, uh, re orange pilled, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so I'm glad to have uh, to have somebody come onto the podcast and talk talk crypto. So thanks again for coming on, and I'll de definitely be paying attention to your project in the future. It was great. All right, Mark, great chatting with you. All right, and uh, see you soon. Talk again. All right, thanks, Michal. Yep. Bye. Well, thanks for listening to this week's Future Tech and Foresight podcast. If you like what you've heard here, there are, of course, a number of ways that you can support the podcast. The best way would be to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or give a rating on Spotify, which you can find a step-by-step -step explanation for on the futuretechandforesight.com website. Alternatively, feel free to leave a comment either on the episode show notes or the YouTube channel where you can see video recordings of the interviews. And finally, if you are part of an organization that is aware of the disruptive and transformational impact that emerging and future technologies will bring and want to know more, please get in touch to hear about the strategic foresight services that we offer and how we can help future-proof your organization and take advantage of the phenomenal opportunities available to survive and thrive in the future. A lot of future shock people and future shock institutions in our society are simply overwhelmed. Once there is super intelligence, the fate of humanity may depend on what the super intelligence does. Science fact is catching up to science fiction. The first truly intelligent machine will be the last invention that humanity needs to make. The only scarcity that will exist in the future is that which we decide to create ourselves as humans. Within a 10 year design revolution, we can have all humanity living the highest and living anybody's ever known. Progress is uh, accelerating at an exponential pace and it's gonna reach a point where progress is so fast it's going to be a singularity. We are probably one of the last generations of homo sapiens. Every single headline points to the birth pangs of a type 1 civilization.